Live from San Francisco, California, it's The Cube at VMworld 2014, brought to you by VMware, Cisco, EMC, HP, and Nutanix. Welcome back to San Francisco, everybody. This is Dave Vellante, and this is theCUBE. We're live at VMworld 2014. This is our second day. We'll be here all day today and tomorrow, Wednesday. We're in Moscone South, stop in. We're in the lobby, just on the right-hand side. VMware, as always, has set us up with this really awesome you know, configuration. It's probably our, our best CUBE day in terms of uh, setup and branding and signage and space. It's really good flow, so thank you to, to VMware. So, we have been digging in to, to Flash in a big way and talking a lot about storage architectures and we got a special guest here today. Uh, Simak Nazari is here. He is an HP fellow, uh, the architect of 3PAR, uh, a product set that we've been following for quite some time. In fact, when 3PAR Simak was being acquired in that bidding war with Dell, we were here at VMworld, it was predicting what the next round of, of increase would be. You must have actually, <laughs> that must have been a fun time for you. Yeah, that was, that was <laughs> uh, such a roller coaster ride for about two weeks. But a good it, roller coaster yeah, ride, you know? Yeah, every, every morning <laughs> it was a high again, so yeah. yeah, there was no lows then. Yeah. Yeah. Right. That, that should happen to everybody. Yeah. That's, exactly. <laughs> that's, uh, exactly. So anyway, welcome back to theCUBE. It's good nice. to have you again. We spent some time last week in Boston. That's Thank right. you guys for coming out. We did the analyst briefing. It was good, I thought, a lot of interaction. There were probably almost 30 analysts there. That's right, and, that's uh, right. Really good discussions. Um, so I want to sort of start with um, the big question that everybody has always had. 3PAR, the architecture, you were instrumental in making that happen. And you know, we've talked about this, you and I, in the past. When thin provisioning was coming into vogue, you guys had sort of perfected this, this notion. And everybody else said, oh, we have that too. They came on and they bolted it on. And, Everybody, everybody said, well, no, no, we're great, we're just the same as 3PAR, but it turned out it probably wasn't so much the case. It really was sort of a checkoff item for them. Exactly. That architectures really were fundamental and made a difference. Now we come to this flash. HP said, well, we don't need to acquire an all-flash array company. Sure. We've got the architecture for that. And everybody said, oh, come on, this is a bolt-on. Um, why was that not the case? Uh, people thought that was the case. It appears it wasn't. Why did people miss? That fundamental. So, so I think a lot of it has to do with the mindset of the software that gets generally developed for firmware-based appliances, right? They tend to have a very fixed architecture. They don't really follow good software design model with well-defined interfaces between layers. They don't define the kind of virtualization layer, rate layer, scheduling layer, memory management layer. It all sort of mishmash all in one sort of infrastructure, and that's been sort of the, the model prior to 3PAR. I think people think about 3PAR as having you know, innovated in white striping and sort of a, you know, having all the system resources in, in use at the same time, but some of the innovation is also around thinking about the software as a server operating system, right? So when you think about something like Windows NT, it's been around for how many years now? You, don't, you know, it was on a single socket, single core you know, CPU at the time, and years later, it's running on you know, eight sockets, you know, 20 cores per socket, and you don't think that, nobody comes and says, well, it was designed for a single core system, right? The fact is that if you, if you set it up correctly from the beginning, and if you architect it correctly from the beginning, then it can evolve as the hardware evolves, right? And so that was the mindset. There was really a bunch of server designers and operating system designers from Sun that started the company, right? And from the very beginning, we just had that mindset of designing a server operating system, not so much a storing our storage operating system. A storage happens to be a personality of the operating system itself. Really, that's the best way to think about it. It's interesting. Well, how come Sun could never get storage right, but the Sun guys, when they pop out of Sun, could get it right? Because they kept purchasing the stuff as it was <laughs> developing stuff. I think that's part of the problem. I think they had you know, a lot of people working on the, on the OS and, and, and on the storage side, they sort of kept chasing the dream of buying something ready-made. I think that was part of the problem, I think. It's amazing, actually, when you look at the history of this business. I mean, I used to have conversations with McNeely all the time and say, you got to get your storage act together. Right. Yeah, well, we're going to buy this company, you're right. That's and, right. And IBM, same thing. You know, well, right. After IBM's, you know, sort of got kicked in the knee by That's EMC right. those years, 
you know, and I used to talk to guys like Bill Zeitlin and say, well, yeah, I got to get storage right. And they, what, they, what they do, they outsourced it to Milex and yeah, exactly. you know, LSI, et cetera. Exactly. So like you said, it's a, it's a mindset, but it's just interesting what you're saying that Windows actually, Windows Server is actually architected very well. Exactly. Um, which is probably a bunch of ex-digital guys exactly, who did that, right? Exactly, <laughs> no, 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 like HP actually, it turns out digital too, right. like you said HP now. Right, but right, yes. right, so, but, but they had that systems level of expertise. Exactly. Uh, and you're talking about you know, componentized uh, exactly. uh, architecture. So, but so that, so now carry it through to help me understand the answer to my question, which is how does that relate to, to, to Flash? You're saying that you were able to then sort of morph the system so it right. would so, look so like a born in Flash right. Right. So, so the way, the way, the best way to look at it is that you know, we have the logical disk layer and then we have sort of the, the physical disk layer and then we have the virtualization layer, right? So what we did, we actually took a, you know, a systemic approach and said, okay, what would the flash mean to the physical disk layer? Well, things have to be you know, in a much lower latency. And so, so we, we looked at how do we actually DMA the data back and forth. So we made a bunch of optimizations there. The logical disk layer had to be changed because now we realized that you know, we had optimized it for disks where it was hopping you know, from disk to disk every 128 kilobytes. Well, you know, that's because you wanted the sequential I.O. to hit the same disk, right? It turns out that the sequential I.O. and jumping from disk to disk doesn't really have a penalty for SSDs because they don't have a seek access. It turns out that that was designed to actually be able to actually go to much smaller module sizes of 32 uh, kilobytes. So we can now hop from drive to drive every 32 kilobytes. Then you go to the virtual, virtual volume layer and look at, okay, what do I do with the virtual volume layer? And, th and we had to do a bunch of optimization having to do with remote DMA. In fact, there were some features in the ASIC that we had not turned on because we never really needed the performance. This is sort of going back and designing the architecture early on, thinking that we will need these if the performance curve gets there. And that's exactly what we did. We had not needed it, but now the flash comes into play. We go and turn that feature on and then we actually pick up a 30% latency improvement in the IO just because we never really had needed that particular IO path. So it really is sort of going through every single layer and say, what does this really mean architecture-wise? And if you put it all back together, then you have an architecture that is much more optimized than it was. When did you start this? Was it 98, 90, 99? Uh, it was 99, that's right. Okay. That's right. So 1999, you weren't thinking about Flash, I presume, I don't, right? No, nobody, I mean, no, so you you know, nobody really knew, exactly. Saying. I mean, you know, we, we thought how could we build the fastest possible systems, assuming there are thousands of drives behind us, right? So now you won't need thousands of drives behind you, maybe you need 20 of them to actually get the same performance you got years ago from thousands of drives. But the point is that we, we built a system that was highly configurable, you know, well layered, so you could actually go and apply optimizations at different layers without necessarily worrying about other layers. I'll give you an example. When the nearline drives came out, we had to go back and because the, the drives are not particularly liable, we had to add RAID 6 to our system, right? But it turns out adding RAID 6, because it was so isolated from the virtual volume layer, you just added it, and then all of a sudden you could actually migrate data back and forth. Uh, as RAID 5 a, almost like a service. As a service, <laughs> yeah. exactly, right? And, and this was one of those things. And, and, and the other nice thing is that you could actually convert these things from FAT to thin, thin to FAT, RAID 1 to RAID 5, RAID 6, from FC to NL, and all those things is because is, is each layer has a well-defined API when it talks to the other layer, it's like a service, right? Okay, well, the, you know, you're changing the quality of service behind you, but since the API doesn't really change from layer to layer, you actually can actually innovate from within each layer without necessarily impacting the entire system or breaking the entire model. Okay, so we're here at, at VMworld, you hear, we get inundated, of course, with software-defined, obviously, That's right? right. It's, the, it's the hot new trend. Yeah, you guys use an ASIC inside That's your correct. system. You said something last week was interesting. Every time we build a new system, we look at it, we say, okay, do we still need to do the ASIC? It's not like we like building ASICs. I wonder if you could sort of recount that conversation. You know, why don't you like doing ASICs and why do you do ASICs? Right, so, so ASICs are quite expensive to build, right? And mistakes are really costly, mm -hmm. right? I mean, they recompile, you know, in a sort of operating system environment world, you know, it's a, it's a 15 minute exercise, right? But in ASIC world, it's a six months exercise and costs a million to, to two million dollars, right? right. So, so, you know, every time we do an ASIC, we step back and say, what are the properties of the ASIC that we actually need? And, and can some other off-the-shelf component, maybe a CPU, maybe some, you know, off-the-shelf, you know, engine that you can buy from a third party, do all the functions that we have? And the answer is, yes, you could, but it turns out the system becomes so complicated and the boards become so large and, the cost, and it becomes cost prohibitive. And the vendors that we go after, they keep changing their mind about whether they want to be in that business or not, right? For instance, we looked at some of the features in Intel, we looked at some of the features in some of the off-the-shelf CPUs, and they keep, you know, and they really have not been you know, constant enough for us to be able to depend on them, right? And so we, we, all come, we always come back to say, well, we really need these features, we really can't get them in a package small enough and cost-effective enough 
So we have to actually go back and, and, and build it. And there's a risk mitigation game. aspect of that too. Yeah, exactly. They might not exactly. be there. And you, exactly, there's a programming yeah, model that, that is well developed, we understand it well, and they have to really fit that programming model. It's a storage device after all. You're, you know, the way I describe a storage device, it's kind of an idiot savant box, right? You know, lots of I.O. bandwidth, very little computing need, because it's not really operating on I.O. So you have to, you know, there are some very specific, you know, so other people who build this stuff, they kind of build a balance system between I.O. and the processing. We, do, we need very little processing, we need a lot more I.O. bandwidth. So, so in a sense, it has some, some very specific properties that it's very difficult to just get from off the shelf stuff. That's interesting, I mean, you're right, that was that, I mean, for decades, and it even continues, that, that notion of balance between I.O. and processing has been fundamental to the architecture That's of right. these subsystems. For That's years, right. You're saying you broke that mo mo exactly, model. Exactly, exactly, because we are much more of an I.O. processing engine. We are not really interested in the contents of the bits that are going by, right? There's very little processing that gets done on, those, uh, on that data. So, so in fact, when you look at the actual memory bandwidth you need, you know, we have a lot more memory bandwidth that you can get it that from a normal two-socket system. You know, if you need the same memory bandwidth, you have to actually go to four socket system to get the same memory bandwidth. But then you have a lot more compute power than you really need. So, so the CPUs are sitting there idle, and you're just putting them there for the memory bandwidth. Well, it turns out that because our ASIC has memory, you actually get the memory bandwidth necessary without necessarily having the extra compute sitting there doing nothing. So right? in the early days, you did a lot of things to sort of address the performance drawbacks of spinning disk, like your wide striping, and you, de you dealt with the the efficiency issue with things like thin provisioning, and then now Flash comes along, and you're saying you had to do a lot of work. That's right. You know, it took a long time and some resources to, Absolutely. to actually get there, but the architecture accommodated that. Now, That's last right. summer, you came out with your first instantiation of the all-flash array. That's right. And relative to where you are today, and even at the time, myself and others said, wow, it's kind of expensive, sure. it's kind of okay at this, okay at that, it's okay at latency, okay at, uh, at IOPS, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Sure sort of middle of the road and, and pricing was, or the cost was okay. Sure. Uh, and now all of a sudden, a year later, you're sub $2 a, a gigabyte, you're for the industry best in class in, in, in latency, sure. um, et cetera. So what happened? So a lot of it has to do with the fact that we take a very systems approach to, to the design, right? And that's an advantage that we have over a lot of other people where they buy off the shelf hardware or they have lots of hardware but they have very little software, right? Mm -hmm. It seems to be two design model where there's people who buy just off the shelf hardware and a lot of their IO stack actually comes from the Linux community and they, they buy a lot of software in the middle, right? Since we have a systems approach that up and down, we can actually talk, talk to the firmware vendors on the HPA side, the firmware vendors on the, on the drive side. We've been actually been developing stuff with the drive vendors on, on the one end and the HPA vendors on the other end. So if you just continuously look at up and down the stack, I, I, you know, I told you that we were looking at everything up and down the stack. That stack extends to the, to the actual partners that work with us on the drive side and on the front end, the HPA side. And that's really been our approach, right? You know, every time we, we, we put out a product, we run a series of benchmarks and tests, we look at you know, what are the opportunities for us to improve. And that's really the continuation of that, that process where, where so almost like the Toyota model. Every year we actually look at the stuff that we could do better and we actually go and modify and make them better. And we're not done. I think there is a lot of stuff that is left that for us to be done. And, and I think this, is, this has been interesting to actually you know, step back and peel it open and say where can I actually modify stuff to get them better. So could we talk specifically about the sure. cost reductions? Um, and obviously there's, there's MLC, there's mm -hmm. higher density devices, there's other data uh, uh, reduction technologies. Can you talk specifics? Sure, so, so the perfect example, initially the, the cost was you know, prohibitively high, partly because we were using really expensive EMLC devices, right? And it turns out now we have lots of telemetry information coming back from the systems in the field and we understand exactly how they're being utilized. And so we went to commercial grade MLCs and then this is something that we did with our partners. We looked at the actual, um, what we call right application that is happening in these devices and what can we do to actually reduce that. It turns out if you look at the EMLC and then CMLC, the biggest difference is just really around the amount of data that is set aside for over provisioning of the drive, so the drive can effectively do wear leveling on the device itself, right? It turns out our white striping actually gives us an opportunity here because what happens, you know, we actually set aside a, par a portion of each drive as a spare. So if a drive fails, we are reconstructing to all the other drives. Kind of unlike sort of the old RAID model where you have a single drive that is set a hot spare and if something fails, you just rebuild drive to drive. We actually build drive to spares and the spares are distributed across. Well, it turns out the spares aren't being continuously used. They're just essentially sitting there idle, right? 
So now we talked to our vendors and said, you know, what if we tell you that space is not being used currently and just use it for, for your wear leveling, right? So it is commercial grade drives, but, but they actually have enterprise grade sort of wear level space available to them so that during the normal operations, only during a failure operation do we tell the drive, I need that space back on a temporary basis so we can reconstruct. And then once the reconstruction is finished and, it, and, and the dead drive is replaced, we actually put the data back and the space is then, you know, you know, given back to the drive for its better leveling. So this actually provides us two opportunities here. Number one, the performance of the drive is much higher because the drive doesn't, work, doesn't have to work as, as hard to find empty space to actually land the data in. And number two, it actually improves the, the actual wear on the drive. And, and we can actually see this because we are actually measuring the internals of the drive and, and sort of the right amplification that is happening with and without this adaptive sparing technology that we have. And so that's something that has allowed us to sort of go from these really expensive drives, you know, lots of experience, talking to the vendors, and now we're able to actually pr provide sort of this, this, you know, quantum drop in pricing for the customers. Okay. And then you've obviously added some, some new data reduction technology. That's right. right so, so, so the duplication is what we're adding. Yeah. And Again, we do duplication, one of the things that, that you know, we have lots of data about who uses VMware versus other, mm -hmm. and then we kind of now have a sense of what sort of data reduction we would expect, and what would that do to the amount of write that happens to these drives. So we're comfortable that there will be a, a significant drop to the, to the drive writes, and therefore the overall lifespan of these drives, you're comfortable to actually warranty these for five years for the customers. And that technology is what? Something you guys developed uh, uh, inside of HP, obviously? That's right, is it, absolutely. Is it something that came out of HP Labs? Was it? So we actually had a lot of conversations with them. So there, there, are, there are bits and pieces of the algorithm that are borrowed, but they, they, a lot of their algorithms are, are designed around streaming data. Mm -hmm. Ours is sort of random access block So data. great for backup, but not necessarily for Exactly, exactly. There, there are bits and pieces that you could actually use having to do with their chunking, but there are bits and pieces that you really can't use and it has to be, and plus we have, a, you know, we have our own um, ASIC and we're actually using the CRC engine from the ASIC and, and, and we do the inline computation of the CRC and they use the actual CPU to, to compute the checksums. So, so there are some advantages for us because we can actually do that in line using the ASIC. So what do you see as the future of spinning disk as somebody who's a technologist, you think about these things and obviously you've got to implement, you know, get products to work. I sure. know you spend a lot of time with your team making that happen, but if you step back and look at the, the future of uh, the impact of Flash, the disrupted nature, the share shift that's going on, what do you see as the future for spinning disk? So, so, so it, it, they will have a, I think it will have like a tape Tail. I mean, there was a time when, when backup to disk showed up and that all of a sudden changed the model and a lot of people started backing up to disk, right? As, a, as opposed to backing up the tape. But tape is still there. There's lots of reasons why people, I mean, the density of the tapes are still quite high, right? And the dollar per gigabyte of the tape is still much better than the dollar per gigabyte of, of, um, of disk. So there are some, so, so I think I see a, a really long tail to the drives getting replaced uh, with SSDs. But you know, there will be a clear class of applications that will be switching to SSDs, and I think you, know, you can think of your database, uh, sort of your standard Oracle databases converting to SSDs and, and not looking back. Hmm. All right, so we're out of time, CMAC, but I wonder if you could just sort of bottom line it for us. What should we be paying attention to in terms of uh, what's going on in, in your world with, with 3 par? Uh, with the products that you're developing, what should observers be looking for? Sort of indicators of success or things that we should be paying attention to? So, so it, it, it really is a question of, uh, are you able to take the architecture and, and keep adding interesting new features or interesting new functionalities or personas? So for instance, one of the things we're working on is, is the ability to provide file services from, from the block store, from inside the block store as opposed to some sort of hardware add-on. So the question is, can we sort of take this, you know, modularized design and, and keep adding and, and extending it and then having it more to be able to solve problems that in the past you would have needed two or three different set of solutions to actually solve. That's really our benchmark for success. Can we sort of consolidate it all into a single platform and actually have it you know, meet a whole lot of different needs as opposed to a single purpose need. Great. All right, CMEC Nazari, thanks very much for coming on theCUBE. It's great to have you. Thank you. All right, keep it right there, everybody. We'll be back with our next guest. This is theCUBE, we're live from VMworld 2014. We'll be right back.